black men have no problem at all doing nothing, nothing. to improve the greater good of black society. And that's a shame because part of being a man, the masculine principle is about building and protecting. And you have so many, even with our women, you hear black men say, listen, I don't date black women. I don't want a black woman. Then that means you have no loyalty to the black community. And I'm seeing more and more black men have less and less loyalty to the black community irrespective of whatever form that takes, whether it's marrying a black woman, whether it's helping build a black system, as in the case of Deion Sanders, a lot of black men could care less. You got a lot of uh, American Africans who don't associate with being black. Mm -hmm. So let's be clear about that. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, yeah. straight up a descendant of enslaved Africans, you mm -hmm. understand? Yeah. And don't associate with being black. Yeah, what you know what I mean? You look at all the black celebrities who marry white girls, you know? Yeah. Uh, they don't associate. So, this whole notion of not association with black people is not limited to African immigrants, mm -hmm. as some people would posit the narrative. Mm -hmm. We have just as many American Africans who are as guilty of the same thing. For me, coming from a pan-Africanist perspective, it is a problem within the race. It is not a problem of any particular branch mm -hmm. of the African family. In other words, I see the same thing in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. where you have African people who don't want to be bothered with African people. I see it in the UK, right. where you have African people who don't want to be bothered with African people. I see it in Africa. I see it in South America. That is a problem of the race. Why do you think that is? Self-hatred. Nobody wants to be associated with anything they consider to be an object of ridicule. Mm. Black people will always be scorned by everybody, even our own people, until we make ourselves an object of respect. And we cannot make ourselves an object of respect by begging white people to solve our problems. Mm -hmm. White people are never going to solve black people's problems, but they will keep you believing that they will, i.e. the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. i.e. the President of the United States, i.e. the Congressional Black Caucus. Hope is a very, very powerful weapon against oppressed people because oppressed people tend to rely on external intervention mm -hmm. more than other folks. And they tend to also be extremely religiously immature. So they're looking for God to help them before they help themselves. Mm -hmm. They're looking for the government to help them before they help themselves. So if I want to control black people, all I have to do is make them think help is coming. Yeah. Never deliver the hope. And every election, you're promised that if you just hang in there with us. Four more years, things will get better. Well, guess what? Average black person life expectancy is probably around the mid 70s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. You divide that by four years of every president, whether you live through maybe 25 presidential, presidential elections. So all they have to do is feed you false hope for 25 presidential elections. And the next thing you know, you in the grave. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the strategies of white supremacy to keep black people from solving their own problems mm -hmm. is by making you think hope. Change is coming right. if you just keep hope alive. As Jesse said, <laughs> keep hope alive. And speaking of Jesse, yeah. speaking of Jesse Jackson's 1984, 1988 presidential campaigns, in retrospect, when I studied Jesse Jackson's, who was the first, quote unquote, serious black candidate for presidency of the United States. Right. Now that I look at it in hindsight, I believe the Democratic Party put Jesse Jackson up to running for president. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and the reason why is because the black vote was waning and they needed someone who could re-energize the black base. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is put Jesse out there. Mm -hmm. We know he can't win. He know he can't win, mm -hmm. but he will energize the black vote yeah. and he will bring them back to the Democratic Party. Right. And after he loses the caucus and the major Democratic candidate is anointed, all those black people who put their hope in Jesse was simply transfer the transfer the hope to the new white so savior of the we Democratic Party. That? I asked this question last time you was here. Like, how do we galvanize blacks to get on one accord to, you know, think it's the same way to get off the plantation from being democratic or, or anything that, you know, of that nature? Like, what are some of the things we can do to galvanize the people as a whole to give them, I don't know, incentive or Maybe even hope at the same time. Here's you know? the big problem with that. And that's a very good question you asked in my brother. You got a couple issues. Number one, black people approach all of our problems from the perspective of religion. Right. We do not approach our problems from the perspective of political analysis. We are not deep critical thinkers. Right. Our decisions are made on emotions. We shop based on emotion. We marry based on emotion. We vote based on emotion. We kill each other based on emotion. So what you're saying is let's take a logical, critical, intellectual analysis of what's going on 
with black people. Right. Deep thought and analysis is what we need. Yeah. Black people don't solve their problems like that. We have been brainwashed by black religion to use our imaginations and our emotions. And that's exactly what the power structure uses right. to keep us hooked into their agenda. That's the problem. Black people don't want to think. We want to feel good. And anything that makes us feel good will get our loyalty. So what we have to do is we have to separate out black people who are ready to think from black people who are only interested in feeling how better. Do you, how do you move all of that? I think it's the what generation. A, you know, the younger, younger generation, generation, you know what I'm saying? Because I don't yeah. think the, the younger generation is attached to religion such as our parents mm -hmm. and, 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 you know. They're not, but they are more attached to multiculturalism okay. than the parents okay. were. Okay. So okay. whereas okay. the weakness of the elderly generations is their religious situation, the weakness of the youth is their multiculturalism. Right. So if we look at the 1960s and compare that to the black college campus today, yeah. if you went to the college campus in the 1960s, black or white, Stokely, Panthers, yeah. Yeah. SNCC, right. CORE, right? Mm -hmm. Active. It was all about black issues. Mm -hmm. Right. Go to a college campus today, we fighting LGBT, yeah. mm -hmm. we fighting the environment, right. we're fighting for multiculturalism, we're fighting to get more blacks in the Republican Party. Anything except what matters to us, our young people in the college campuses are involved in that. It is a complete 360 degrees, 365 degrees from where we were. Right. Is it 360, 365 degrees in a complete circle? No, 360. 360. <laughs> it's a complete 360 degree turn yeah. from where we was back in the 1960s. Right. They have multiculturalized our young people. And our young people are also more materialistic. That's yeah. another weakness. Oh, yeah. So the strengths yeah. of the elders are the weaknesses of the youth. And the strength of the youth are the weaknesses of the elders. So the youth are very much more about X's and O's, measurable game. Where's but the they're also spot? more selfish okay. and they're also more multicultural. But where's the sweet spot in that? But the problem with our generation, we suffer from both sides. Yeah. yeah. We got the materialism, the multiculturalism, yeah. the and the religious feel goodism. Most black men have no problem at all doing nothing, nothing to improve the greater good of black society. And that's a shame because part of being a man, the masculine principle, is about building and You hear black men say, listen, I don't date black women. I don't want a black woman. Then that means you have no loyalty to the black community. And I'm seeing more and more black men have less and less loyalty to the black community, irrespective of whatever form that takes. Whether it's marrying a black woman, whether it's helping build a black system, as in the case of Deion Sanders, a lot of black men could care less. Do you think there's a plan to like strip black masculinity? Oh, absolutely. I think you see it even uh, lately with what happened with Jonathan Majors okay. with the Snow Bunny situation. Yeah. And these black celebrities still running around with these white girls is just insane to me. You know, but... All right, the work that you do. All right, we saw a couple of weeks back that somebody busted one of the windows out of the school. Yes. All right. So think, we boarded them back up. Do you think with the work you do, you think that people uh, feel when you're on that you're a scam? For money, you're uh, for money. I think that my detractors. I, I don't believe there's anybody who's think I'm a scam. Okay. Let me let me take that back. I don't think there's anyone who knows me who has ever been in a room with me who thinks I'm a scam. Gotcha. You follow me? Gotcha. I believe that there's people who have not met me mm. who listen to the negativity of the detractors mm. who may think there's some truth to that. Right. Right. You understand me? No, so I if you're it. a second or third party, right. you might because you have no frame of reference. Gotcha. But if you've been around me, you know better. Right. And when we talk about the whole scam narrative that we've been dealing with basically the entire fundraiser, nine years now, it's been put out by jealous persons. Uh, nearly everybody who has led mm -hmm. the We Gotta Stop Dr. Umar movement, right. nearly everyone had a legitimate reason to try to stop my work. Yeah. One guy was like a life coach, but he wasn't successful. He wanted to be a public speaker. He wasn't successful. Mm -hmm. If you look at his website and take his name off and put mine on there, you would think it's Dr. Umar. Mm -hmm. and, he's yeah. one, and he's one of the leaders Right. So it was clear to me the reason you're jealous is you actually wanted to be me. Yeah. Mm. You understand? Mm. If I go to the conscious community, a lot of them guys, they wanted to be me. You understand the popularity, mm. the success, the education, the credentials, the oratorical skill, the DNA. Mm. You understand? The most traveled scholar of the century. If you look at what I've done, there's nobody alive who has the resume. 
I'm talking conscious or mainstream. Nobody has the resume. And very few ancestors even have the resume. Mm -hmm. There's never been a scholar of my stature with my credentials to have the mainstream following of a regular black celebrity. All right. I have the following of a black celebrity. My interviews get more views than people, you understand, who are worth billions of dollars and have sold hundreds of millions of albums. I'm right there when it comes to followership. If you put me in a room with the top 10 black celebrities in the country, don't be surprised if more people come over to me than go over to them. <laughs> So why do you think people... And I've done it without any white platform, any white support. I've never been on Oprah's couch. <laughs> and I'm just as big as anybody who's been on Oprah's couch. Yeah, gotcha. So why do you think people, even black people, choose to cast doubt on a black man that's trying to do something positive? For the community. Well, number one, for some black women who suffer from reactionary feminists, mm -hmm. they don't like to see black men succeed, period, because they see the black man as the enemy. Mm -hmm. Feminism has conditioned a lot of black women, not all, not most, but many, to see the black man as the enemy. He must be stopped at all costs. And I also think I get some of the vicarious trauma of black women yeah. who look at me and see the husband who left them, yeah. see the baby see daddy who husband. left them, see the, the, the boyfriend who who abused them. You understand me? Yeah. So since I'm out there and I'm prominent and psychology is my platform, I think they transfer onto me a lot of the traumatic feelings they've had for significant others in their life. I get a lot of that. You understand? For the black men, it's just pure jealousy. Pure un jealousy. And the issue with brothers is that ego. You understand? And we got to go back to the plantation because one of the things that the plantation bred into African people's collective consciousness mm -hmm. is this belief that only one of you can succeed at a time. Mm -hmm. See, on the plantation, the manumission laws, you let one slave go a year. Only one. So the slaves started working against each other because they knew only one or two or three, but never all. So the white man was very clever and crafty in making sure that any benefits we gave to the enslaved African could only be enjoyed by a select few. This automatically make you a competitor with the people you should be collaborating with. So when people see me doing what I do because of the slave mentality, they say, if Dr. Umar is winning, nobody else can. Right. That's totally wrong. Yeah. All of us can win and we can win at the same time if we just work together. The jealousy in the black community is largely due to this idea that the white man gave us as part of our post-traumatic slavery disease that only one black person can win at a time. So if they see Tyler Perry with his own studio, no other black person can do it because Tyler did it. That's not true. There could be a million more black studios. You see a black person with a new restaurant in Jackson, right? Right. People hate. Why? Because they, they did it first, so nobody else can do it. But there's a hundred white restaurants. There's a hundred white movie studios. There's a dozen white airlines. Why is it with every other group, there can be multiple people succeeding in the same sphere of life. But with black people, we've been conditioned to believe that only one can make it. And the one who's making it is the reason you can't. That's what they taught us to believe. That is the basis of Negro jealousy.